Hi, I'm Kurt Hardin, and I'm a master's student at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. And I'm going to tell you all a little bit about my research on a very interesting genus of carabids called Anilinus. Anilinus occur in the eastern United States. Um, currently, there are 61 described species, and there are over 30 undescribed species that I'm aware of. And most of this diversity is centered in the Appalachian Mountain region. All Anilinus are eyeless, and they also lack flight wings. And they're pretty small as far as carabids go. They tend to be around two millimeters or less. And uh, like most beetles with these qualities of small size, eyelessness, flightlessness, most of the species have quite small ranges and uh, presumably they don't disperse very well. But despite this, the genus as a whole is pretty widely distributed in Eastern United States. And if you're familiar with the region, you'll tell just by looking at this map that they also occur at a pretty wide range of altitudes and habitat types. You can see they've been collected down near sea level in Florida. They've been collected up in the coniferous forests of the Alleghenies and the Southern Appalachians. And uh, part of what might explain this wide range of habitat uses is that at a finer scale, uh, different species seem to show preferences for strata layers. Um, if you go down from leaf litter to soil to interstitial rock layers and caves, there are species that seem to specialize in existing in these different habitat types. And uh, these side profile photos here are just illustrating some morphological generalities associated with these different habitats. Um, the ones that occur in leaf litter tend to be more convex compared to the ones that occur in deep soil layers, which are usually flatter and sometimes quite pale and elongate. And the cave species tend to look a lot like soil species. And in fact, a lot of them probably are just soil species that wandered into the cave. And uh, these subterranean species are much more rarely collected than the litter species. Um, you can often get large series of litter species just by sifting superficial soil layers and litter while uh, these other ones require more specialized techniques such as uh, buried pitfall trap like the one pictured here. And this is just showing some dorsal habituses of a uh, litter dwelling Anilinus. That's a one millimeter scale on the left there. As you can see, they're pretty similar to one another. There's a little bit of variation in the shape of the pronotum or overall size, but not much. And certainly not much compared to the variation you see in the soil dwelling Anilinus, which come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And uh, a lot of these differences in shapes are sex specific. Um, for instance, this one here that's third from the right, you see it has very sloped humeral angles on the elytra. And this is a female. And that's characteristic of the group that this species belongs to, where females will often have this kind of hourglass shape. And uh, you can compare that with the one to the left that has a more blocky, strongly angled humeral angle. And if you can see on the specimen on the far left, uh, the hind femora have these distinct spines coming off. And that's also something you see in a lot of soil Anilina species, but you don't see in litter dwellers. And not every soil species has this, but in some species, the males will have these, and presumably it has something to do with holding on during mating in a soil habitat. And there's some trends in uh, genitalia morphology as well. Um, in general, the Ediagus of litter dwelling Anilinus is a bit more simple compared to the ones that occur in soil that tend to have a few more scales and spines and unusual shapes. And the same is true for uh, female genitalia. The spermatheca of litter Anilinus tend to be either a S shape or kind of a candy cane shape while the soil species have a wide range of shapes and sizes. Another quality of Anilinus is that it's common to find more than one species at a given location. And these are just four examples of uh, some species you can find at these different sites. But that map that I showed earlier, um, most of those dots on the map are 
shared by at least two species. It's actually more unusual to not find at least two at a given location. And you'll notice in these three mountain locations of Big Bald, Rich Mountain, and Stratton Ridge, there's a pretty even distribution of litter and soil species, while it, at a lower elevation site like this one in South Carolina, um, at least in my experience, there are no litter species, and yet there are three soil dwelling species. And this is another trend that you see in the genus where at lower elevations where it's hotter and drier compared to the mountains, you tend to find anilinus deeper down. So all of this combined um, makes it a bit unwieldy to try to figure out what's going on. Like where do these soil species fall in with the litter species? Uh, you know, which of these characters reflect shared ancestry and which are just related to living in the soil. So uh, it's a good case for uh, the need for a molecular phylogeny. There's not much external morphological characters that are apparently good. So uh, since I started grad school last August, I've uh, collected around 450 anilinus. I have extracted DNA from 234 of those. And those represent around 40 species, about half of which are undescribed. And uh, that's including additional specimens from other members of my lab and a couple other collectors that have sent me things. And uh, this is one of my vouchers on the left. Uh, since these are so small, I've been doing whole body extractions, which makes it a lot easier to dissect these because all the musculature is digested. And uh, my goal has been to sequence these four genes for every species I have. And in parentheses there are the number of specimens I have those genes sequenced for. Um, that's a mitochondrial protein coding gene, CO1, two nuclear protein coding genes, CAD and wingless, and then a 28S, uh, ribosomal DNA fragment. So this is the phylogeny um, using only those specimens for which I have all four of those genes sequenced. Um, these red blocks are showing soil dwelling individuals. Just to show you that soil dwelling individuals occur in almost every major clade in the genus. And here's the same tree but I've indicated where the uh, highly modified, flat, elongate, pale soil species fall out. Um, just to show these aren't a monophyletic group, um, that morphology has apparently evolved multiple times. And here's the same tree with uh, the larger clades collapsed just to make it easier to read. Um, these are ultra fast bootstrap values at the nodes. Oh, and I forgot to mention these are, this is a maximum likelihood tree from uh, IQ tree. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff here that I wish I had time to talk about, but I'm just going to point out three interesting clades. Uh, first of all, the Moselier group and the Barbari group are kind of unusual among the genus because they tend to live in pretty cold places, either really high elevations or northern latitudes. Uh, here's the distribution of the two groups mapped out. And that yellow arrow there is indicating the uh, Asheville Basin formed by the French Broad River. That's a famous biogeographic barrier that separates a lot of other flightless animals like salamanders and various flightless beetles. And in the CO1 and CAD gene trees, these two form a moderately supported clade. And they do have some morphological characters in common, but um, adding the other two genes made that fall apart. So. The relationship between them isn't clear, but the rest of Anilinus, exclusive of these two groups, is a well-supported clade. So um, their position at the base of the tree and their apparent restriction to these colder regions suggests that maybe these are lineages that have persisted in the mountains for a relatively long time. Um, here I'm just pointing out that uh, Pretty much all of the common litter dwelling species are at the opposite end of the tree in a moderately supported clade together. And sister to those is this clade that I call the ESP clade. And that's one of the most interesting results in this tree. And uh, it's called that because it includes the elongatus group 
uh, clade I call the South Carolina clade because so far it's only been found in South Carolina, and Anilinus pecai. And uh, this map here is showing them. You can see that these are three allopatric groups. And uh, before I made this phylogeny, there was nothing really about their morphology that suggested they might be closely related. And they uh, also differ in habitat use. The elongatus group is at low elevations in the Piedmont. And uh, they're all very pale, elongate, skinny species. Whereas Pecai is a common litter dweller. It looks a lot like all the other litter species. And the South Carolina clade, so far they've only been collected from soil, but they're not heavily modified for a soil existence. They're just really small. But uh, this clade is present in all of the gene trees except CO1, and it's strongly supported by the uh, four gene phylogeny. The relationships among these three are not well resolved, and um, I'd really like to resolve them either with more markers or more species because uh, it's just very interesting how these three very different groups apparently may have shared a common ancestor. If you look at the ADA guy, there are some similarities you can see, but externally they're quite different. And uh, the last thing I want to point out is that the sister to that ESP clade plus all the common litter species is a small clade with only two species in it. One of them is the one that occurs in the sand hills in Florida, and the other occurs in the Piedmont in South Carolina. And those two are in a clade together, and it's supported strongly by all four genes. Uh, their position within the phylogeny as a whole isn't well resolved, but um, the strongest support comes for them being sister to everything else. And this is a pattern that has been found in other flightless animals like millipedes and salamanders, um, where the coastal plain served as a refuge over geologic time and things subsequently dispersed from it. So it's interesting, but uh, not very well resolved. So in the future, um, there are a few more species I'd like to get. I have a lot more analyses I need to do, obviously. Um, I'm gonna describe some of these species I discovered. And I want to make it easier for other people to study and collect Anilinus. And one thing that I think would help with that is making a more accessible distributional database available. And I uh, want to acknowledge all these people, the Clemson University Arthropod Collection, the staff of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, Carnegie Museum of Natural History, of course, the Coleopterist Society for their generous support, um, which helped make sequencing those four genes possible for me. And of course, all the collectors who sent me specimens that I've listed here. Uh, permits came from the South Carolina State Park Service and Department of Natural Resources. And uh, additional support came from a E.W. King Endowed Memorial Grant Fund from Clemson University. And with that, I'll end. And I'd like to say uh, collecting soil beetles is a lot of fun, and I think everyone should do it. And uh, reach out to me if you're interested in any of this. I love to talk about it more. So. Thank you and hopefully there's time for questions. <laughs>